the square card or a visa card sort of thing it's square they, they oh. run them yeah so wow but I, I love cards, cards. i don't know i don't know how that's not a thing Yeah. So aim for square, guys. Moral of the story. Where else? I feel like I wouldn't want to work at one of those like 23andMe and like Ancestry.com. I would IBM, want to... bro. That's where we should go. No, yeah. IBM is boring. <laughs> They're literally like walking graveyard. <laughs> what do you think Apple PMs do? Like, do you think that's fun? I think that is the that should also be in everyone's list. I've heard you need to have like strong ML knowledge even to get like a new grad interview though for a PM position at Apple. Like Apple positions are really specific, like specific PM for this, 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 and this thing for that, that, that. Like it's really, it's really specific in Apple. Instead of hiring people who are management focused, they tend to hire or they tend to promote whoever comes in there for engineering or design or whatever. Yeah. They like to keep people it would around. Be cool to work on like CarPlay, like a PM for CarPlay. That would be cool. Mm, that, that would actually be interesting. But it's also so hard, I feel like, because there's such differing hardware and the way you interact with CarPlay in general. Yeah, that's true. Do we have anyone from engineering here? Or is everyone CICS? Everyone, yeah, so we don't know anything about hardware. Oops. Sad. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Dhruv, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, I thought we could just do like a semester, um, not, not a semester, like a week check-in, um, like with highs and lows. Um, so I can begin. Um, my low has been that it's been training for me. Um, I've had, I've been having long days. So just like sleeping for like four or five hours a day. Um, and my high is that I have like a bunch of interviews lined up this week. So hopefully those go well. Um, but yeah, I'll popcorn it to um, Aditya. I forgot the other one and you're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, what am I even saying? Okay, yeah, so I low is pretty much the same as Dove. It's just like a lot of work, not a lot of sleep, that kind of thing. High is I, this is like a super low high, but like I, was, I, I had a paper due for like, a, 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 wow, a history course. And like, I just, I felt, I feel like I did really well in it, so. Yay, but yeah, that's it. Nice. Uh, I'll popcorn it over to Pritham. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Start off with low. Low has definitely been machine learning homework. That thing sucks. Don't take that class ever. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I just, I always leave everything to the last minute for some reason. And I definitely suffered today. Uh, in terms of high, I tried the coolest Starbucks drink ever. It's a, <laughs> it's a chai latte with a vanilla sweet cream, cold foam, and strawberry puree inside the cold foam. Magna can attest to this. Magna, you trained him well. Good job. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, um, I'll popcorn to Nico. Uh, hey, so in terms of lows, um, I, we have like a bunch of midterms this week. I think like everyone knows that CST four five. And then we, I had, um, an OI midterm yesterday. I forgot what midterm I had. I had to look back. Um, uh, in terms of highs, um, I don't know. I've been working out and I stuck to a routine for like a week now. So let's hope that sticks, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I'm going to push it over to Natan. Thank you, Nikhil. Um, my low would be that I'm just a little brain dead. I feel like I've just been working in my like, dark room all day. I definitely need to go outside like Disha. Um, and my high would be that just like, um, I forget, oh, uh, Drew said, I also have um, a couple of interviews this week. So definitely looking forward to tackling those. I'll pass it on to Magna. Um, I guess my low is that I have an essay due Friday that I haven't started yet. And my high is that I've been enjoying the weather today, so that was nice. Um, I'll pass it over to the show. Is it because we both have that essay due Friday? <laughs> <laughs> um, my low has been, I think, just a lot of work. Like, it's hard to keep track of all the midterms you have when, like, every single class has midterms in them. 
Um, and then my high is probably just the weather. I'm not in Amherst, so it's like sunny outside, which is really nice. Um, it's actually sunny here today, so. Okay, whatever. But yeah, it's sunny here. Yep. Interview. Um, and I'll popcorn it to Govind. Hey everyone. Uh, well, I guess my low has been just work. I guess just like everyone else, just lying to myself. The next day is going to be better. Just never is. Uh, but I guess the high would be that I might be free on the weekends. I I will look at it as a high to be honest. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and I popcorn it to Kyle. Um. I guess my low is that I've just had to spend so much of my time doing some really useful stuff for school, just wasting time. Um, and the high would probably be that I finally finished this mining thing I was working on with someone that's done, so. Awesome, is that everyone? Hmm? Pretty much. Um, so I- Yeah, think, yeah. Um, sorry, did you have something in mind? Yeah, I don't think it much it was. <laughs> so, oh, my bad. Yeah, no, so, go for it. No, 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 no problem. So my low would be that um, yeah, obviously, um, I've been teaching a class, so I, I haven't been like creating papers since like two weeks back. So like everything's been on, uh, and it's like you tomorrow. So I'm gonna like create a ton of papers uh, tonight. And um, the high, my high was I uh, went to play volleyball and frisbee today. So that was like after a really, 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 really long time. So like maybe after high school for the first time. So yeah, that is that is that was my high of for today. That's really nice. Awesome. Um, so um, I thought uh, we are just gonna be talking about section two thirty because it's in the news uh, with everything that's been going on. So um, I think Disha has a few videos to show us and then we can just um, have a discussion and open it up to everyone. Yeah, by a show of hands, like how many people know what section 230 is? Okay, so we got like two, three. Okay, so I guess we all are kind of like, <laughs> like we know, but you're not 100% sure. And then a few of us like concrete know. So Preetham actually found this video. Um, and let's go ahead and look. So, hold up. It is a little bit long, but hopefully it does explain well. For more than 350 years, Black Pit Masters were here. Section 230 has become the single most important law. Am I the only one that can't see the screen? <laughs> yeah, I, can. I can't see hers yeah. either. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing Just your screen, Disha. You know. Yeah, I literally just said started sharing your screen. <laughs> and that's all it says. You, oh, this is the wrong screen. Wait, okay, what yeah, screen is it? Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you had it there. And then it went away. You had it there. Had it. How about yes. now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Are you sure? What does it say? <laughs> Shows you the video. The video, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, maybe when I go full screen, then that's why you can yeah. see it. Yeah, so you can go full screen and then share that screen. Are you on a Mac? Yeah. So go full okay. screen, and then it'll give you a different option to share. I'm pretty sure. Um, do you see it? Yes. Okay. Section 230 has become the single most important law shaping online platforms. In simple terms, it's the law that protects services if a user posts something illegal. But as these services have become bigger and more controversial, people are more seriously calling for the law to change. If you have any kind of problem with Facebook or YouTube, somebody's probably proposed fixing it by changing Section 230. And as pressure in Congress builds, those fixes could have huge consequences for the rest of the internet. When 230 is created, it is created by people newly creating this nascent internet. Our laws shouldn't remain stagnant as they were 25 years ago. It doesn't mean we get rid of them. It means we change them. So let's talk about how we got here. In the mid nineties, a lot of the internet was message boards, some tiny and independent, others on bigger services like CompuServe, Prodigy, and AOL. And when a user posted something libelous or otherwise illegal, a couple of court rulings effectively punished companies for moderating content. 
they basically said that if a site took down some posts, it could become legally responsible for other posts, while just letting a service run wild could keep companies out of trouble. Lawmakers thought this was a bad idea. So when they passed the Communications Decency Act in 1996, they included Section 230 to settle the question. The first part says that interactive computer services, apps, websites, newspaper comment sections, AOL, and so on, can't be legally treated as the publisher of their users' posts. The second part says you can't sue a platform for good faith moderation efforts. Overall, the point is simple. When a site or app accepts user-generated content, it typically doesn't accept liability for that content, no matter how it moderates. A lot of conservative politicians have gotten this wrong, claiming there are separately regulated categories of platforms and publishers, and that moderation makes you a publisher with more legal liability. In reality, Section 230 was literally written so this wouldn't happen. So some of these same politicians have tried to roll back or abolish Section 230 to change this, trying to make it tougher for sites to suspend users like former President Donald Trump. As you know, I have voices on the platform are possible. We see a lot of abuse and harassment, which ends up silencing people and having them leave from the platform. This is The Pit. For more than 350 years, Black Pit Masters were... Now, the First Amendment also says companies probably don't have to publish speech they don't like, including Trump posts. But Section 230 makes it easier to fight a potentially expensive lawsuit. When Democrats like current President Joe Biden talk about abolishing Section 230, though, they're usually referring to a more complicated problem. If somebody slanders you in a YouTube video or criminally harasses you on Facebook, Section 230 says you should sue or prosecute the original offender, not the platform that hosts them. But on an internet with billions of users, troll mobs and automated systems can spread this content really fast, and going after each user is almost impossible. Lots of Democrats and some Republicans want sites to take a more active role in policing illegal content. And they think that right now, Section 230 lets companies escape responsibility. I just think that social media has to be more socially conscious of what is important in terms of our democracy. I, for one, think we should be considering taking away the exemption that they cannot be sued for knowingly engaged on promoting something that's not true. Trusting that they will be regulated into actually caring about the problems of hate speech is, in my opinion, a very silly wicket if you're going to do it by, by a 230. The Internet's issues are way bigger than Section 230. To explore them, The Verge held a panel discussion with the general counsels of the Wikimedia Foundation and Vimeo, as well as writer and researcher Sadat Harry. They laid out the complex problems that any legal reform would have to deal with, and the potential impact of getting it wrong. No amount of Section 230 reform is going to fix the fact that the First Amendment also protects a lot of speech online. Even if you took away Section 230 today, you're still not going to be able to sue platforms for you know, misinformation about the election. Uh, misinformation about vaccines, you know, things that are hateful to minority groups. But if you look at the people who actually do sue for things like defamation, it's generally the people in power. Uh, it's not the people out of power. And so by removing Section 230 protections, do you privilege those people over people who can't afford a lawyer and will never sue you anyway? Uh, I think you probably do. It just becomes the billion dollar tech companies throwing money around to silence whoever's going to be a problem. And no matter what, if it goes to money and law, the people will lose. And that is the worst possible outcome. These issues go way beyond quote unquote big tech. There are smaller sites that basically exist just to promote harassment, non consensual pornography. And okay, I think we got the gist. Um, all right. So, does anyone want to give a quick recap, like, in 10 words, about what Section 230 is? Preetham, go for it. It was your video. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, if I had to use 10 words, i say, what you say, you can no sue, or some shit like that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, basically, what I've understood from the video is that Platforms like Facebook, Twitter, maybe even Reddit, they're not liable for anything you would post. And so if you post something that's, let's say, offensive, criminally harassment, that kind of stuff, it's still not Facebook or Twitter's fault 
and you can't sue them essentially and you have to go after the person that said those things which is hard to do nowadays because of all the bots and all those things but yeah yeah that's that's kind of interesting because that's like it opens up a lot of questions for me in terms of like what tech and what tech can do and what tech can't do um anyone else have any similar thoughts guess not i mean do you mean that like it's like limiting the powers of big tech like something along those lines yeah in a what do you guys think is that- what would companies you know to allow users to publish any content anymore you know if like i could sue facebook for something someone else said about me why would facebook allow user generated content to be there in the first place like there should be enough of an incentive for them are you limiting the kind of lawsuits they're liable to like there there's lots of like nitty gritty details in there like if you can just if i could just sue facebook for anything like even a small lawsuit out there i know like they've got tons of money but it feels like as long as there's some incentive to the big tech companies social media could be used by everyone otherwise it just feels like i don't know it feels like it might not be like i've seen people talk about how like section 230 effectively is like taking away rights from social media platforms you know like you can't post content on reddit facebook and such platforms anymore like imagine i could see a zoom for like talking something over zoom you know if technically i am like say you know communicating something over zoom to a wider audience you know i can just sue zoom after this call and be like Yeah, I said something so and so. You allowed so and so content to be spread. You know, I don't know. It's like politicians just talk about it in vague terms. They really don't understand a lot of tech. Um, that's just my opinion. Well, does anyone think getting rid of section 230 is a good idea? I mean what 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 would happen if they removed it like i i can't even understand what the consequences would be honestly Does facebook just think... get a lot of lawsuits like what yeah, happens they would have to 10x the amount of money they spend on legal but yeah i mean it's not just facebook though right if you think about it like venmo let's say you send money to someone someone you bought something off of on facebook marketplace and your message is not very kind like what if you can sue venmo like there's no stopping yeah like removing the accountability from that actual person and putting it on the platform which i don't know how i feel about yeah i don't think it's the platform's fault entirely agreed like they have like a, a bit of a liability there cuz it's hosted on their platform but it's not entirely their fault still yeah I guess maybe if we're trying to crack down on this then I guess it's like you know investing better resources towards like combating bots and stuff that spreads like fake news quicker. But I don't know that that seems too unrealistic probably. I mean well, these companies, companies do spend a lot of money yeah. on Yeah, I mean if they're going to have to end up burning like 10x on legal they might as well burn that 10x on like preventing bots or or whatever like the big well, issue well, is. There's right? another like, reason to not have bots on your platform. Not just that if you don't do yeah. it Yeah like it Obviously, just makes you it don't nice. want bots exactly yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I feel like it's just free reign you know like what about like workplace harassment like what if you're being harassed by a coworker over slack now the coworker isn't necessarily liable you could just straight up sue slack you'd get a way bigger payout on that okay but like that's i mean that distracts it from the main purpose of it though like <laughs> I mean okay so like the entire issue itself is wrong but like the reason why you're suing the person is to sue like the person who actually harassed you not slack so so you're going to that is just, just I'm so going to what getting rid of section 230 would just completely destroy any accountability that the actual person has well i don't think section 230 makes it where you have to sue the company if you have a problem it may it means that you can so yeah. you could yeah. still sue you could sue both actually is what you would do 
Yeah. The person and Slack. I mean, all they did was give you a communication channel. So does that mean like USPS can get sued now? Like Yeah. That's a good point, actually. Like, I, I think it's it's very it's tied to putting putting media up where a bunch of people see it. So I don't think one to one type of stuff is as applicable. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes what sense. What about the flip side of it? Like where companies are like especially conservative politicians they believe that companies like twitter and facebook they silence conservative voices on their platform so what about that what do you guys think about that side of it because their argument is that twitter and facebook are like the modern town square and that's where people congregate and talk about information so if you're silencing one voice then nobody gets to hear the other side and that's when like apps like parlor parked up I think it's really telling that when you talk to someone on the right, they'll say what you just said. And when you talk to someone on the left, they'll act like there are Nazis everywhere. So also, I, I kind of so feel like no we balance. are actually in the middle. We might actually have the balance right now. Just <laughs> no one's happy because it's not all the way the way they want it. Yeah. It's, I think conservative talk is fine, but I mean, like my I, I main problem it, it is fake news and stuff like that. And it also has to stop where it becomes hate speech at one point. From exactly. conservative talk to hate speech, there is a fine line. And I, okay, I don't know if it's a fine line, but there is a difference. And like, I think maybe the app should take on that responsibility of differentiating between conservative talk and hate speech. And yeah. that could help a lot of stuff too. And yeah, as Pritham said, fake news too, big time. Yeah. That's what happened with Parler too, right? Someone went and investigated the platform and it's just a stupid amount of hate speech and slander and all these things, which is, is that First Amendment stuff? Like, I'm so confused at this point. Like, can you, is hate speech covered under First Amendment? That's interesting. I don't know. I'm guessing. Unfortunately, people, I think it is. It is. Yeah. Because it's your personal views. Which is so crazy. then does moderating that content like violate that right no so what the first amendment says it's not that you can say whatever you want however you want to say it where it means that the government cannot restrict it oh so okay this is how a library can kick you out if you're too loud got it okay you know so it's private companies and people can do whatever they want to restrict your speech okay oh and I think yeah. that's, that's why protesting is missed. compared i guess that tech companies are private companies. Like it's their platform. You sign up for their platform so they can regulate what goes on on their platform. But I think another caveat to that is I was listening to a Wall Street Journal podcast the other day. And apparently in the past presidential elections, the Democratic candidate, his, high, his or her highest number of donations used to come from Hollywood. And this year it was from the tech industry. And it was companies like Microsoft, I think Amazon, Google and Netflix that were like the highest contenders to Democratic parties, which is insane. So I think as a Republican, I might see that, look, like these are people who are literally paying to keep Democrats in power. And that's why they're silencing the other side's voice. So I guess I do get that part where people might think like, okay, like the people aren't neutral, like things like that, but it's a private company. What do you guys think about that? I'm really not sure I buy the whole idea that tech companies silence the right. I, I mean, don't think so either. <laughs> I'm yeah. just being like advocating their Also, thoughts. the thing is like the law just doesn't have origins from like conservative roots right now. Like back when the Christchurch shooting in New Zealand, it happened, I think the messages were posted on Chan or something. And that time it's like a lot, a lot of people, at least a, a lot of politicians on the left were just like, you know, why doesn't like big tech take responsibility for so and so, you know, how, why was this being live streamed, you know, like, how did these platforms allow this content to be put up for such a long time, you know, and at that point, they were just like, shouldn't platforms be held responsible for so and so content because hate speech is also like a problem for the left. It's not just for the right. The, in terms of the left, the left thinks like, at least the politicians on the left, they hold the idea that these platforms just do not have any incentive to moderate hate speech. Like, if I'm not going to be sued for it, what incentive do I have for censoring it? You know, yep. Facebook, like, I mean, Facebook is a pretty good example. Go look in the comments, you know, like, I still see people like talking about, oh, let's, let's, you know, do this, let's do so and so to so and so groups, you know, like, 
I don't think Facebook does a well enough job of moderating, and I don't think they'll ever have the incentive either. Like, as much as it, like, they, I, the conservatives hold that point, I feel like the other point also pretty much holds, like, they, if they're doing moderation, they're just not doing well enough of a job on it, you know? Yeah, I think like what Govin said, sometimes like the hate speech and stuff like that's kind of inevitable. Like you have people out there who will always want to just say bullshit. But at the end of the day, I think that like if Facebook or one of these apps took better like responsibility in like getting the, 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 the hate speech or whatever out quick enough before it spreads or even fake news before it spreads, then it would like be really helpful, I guess. And like, again, they have to be incentivized yep, to do that. Yeah, because I think right now, hate speech conversations and sort of like controversial conversations drive their platform too right because that means more users coming in more users using the platform more ads for them and things like that so it kind of incentivizes them the other way i feel if they don't try too hard to moderate those kind of conversations i think it's the government like they need to do something yeah there's a more than just like scrapping out a whole oh sorry 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 go on kyle his vision of the world is that everyone can, you know, total freedom of everything. So it's, at least for Facebook, it's, it's, a, it's tough for them to put on the clamps because it goes against what their view of the world is. But I think the government needs to be smart about it and regulate them, like incentivize them properly. Like, for example, I heard, I don't remember where, but someone was talking about how, oh, I think it was in Swipe to Unlock. If you've read Swipe to Unlock before, they were talking about how companies like Twitter, or not Twitter, but Facebook and Amazon, they collect an insane amount of data on every single one of us. Like what time we wake up, what time we use the app, what features do we use? And they have free reign to collect as much data as they want on every consumer because there's no incentive to not collect that much data. So if there's a data tax on the number of parameters you can collect per consumer and kind of like an income tax bracket, like four parameters, you pay this much, five parameters, you pay that much, that'll incentivize companies to collect less data. And that's like such a well thought out plan that if the government could actually implement, it would actually incentivize companies like Amazon and Facebook and even Apple who collect Mm -hmm. ridiculous amounts of data points on us to actually tone it down. So I think there needs to be some like well thought out incentive or legal issue to get companies to actually care about trust and safety. That's news yeah. to me that Apple collects a lot of data. I think it's I just think like they very do. They private. They don't share it, but they share a lot. So, I mean, okay. they collect. A lot. Then what about like why companies collect data, right? That you owe, you make a trade, and there's some famous expression where like if you're not paying for the product, then you are the, you're the product. You are yeah. The product. <laughs> I think so, everything just from social dilemma that you said too the data tax thing oh maybe yeah. that's where it was from yeah that's what i was thinking from there but like what if the like same. all these parameters kind of um i guess they ask you where you reduce live, your experience wait what kyle sorry what well it doesn't matter okay Preetam, go ahead <laughs> no what i was saying is like let's say they don't take enough data what if that kind of hampers your experience let's say something like apple right if apple's not allowed to collect as much data maybe your spotlight search sucks now because they don't know what you're about to do i yeah. mean in that case like your personalization would um deteriorate right because like netflix and facebook yeah like, on data to like personalize your feed and to basically do everything to cater to you so it's basically like a hands-on, like a benefit and a disadvantage as well. Well, I guess what we need to do is define data collection because, yeah, I mean, you all know how machine learning works. Hey, so Nanya. I guess there is some level of data collection where it doesn't really leave your phone or it doesn't leave the service and it's all encrypted. And they have no idea who you are. But then there's also data collection where there's a name and a location, everything you do. So I think one of those is bad and one of those maybe isn't so bad. Or maybe there should be regulation on where the data is going after. Like if it's within your own entity, then it's fine. But if you're sharing it, then that might be a problem sort of thing. I was just about to say what Freedom said. I feel like if companies are like selling data, like maybe we should like actually strictly monitor that. Like if, if Or even tax like, that. Tax shared data tax and like data. keep. Yeah. Um, so like if Grubhub or whatever is like selling data to like insurance companies, you know, that's like a problem. But like if like, Apple is collecting data on you just to like, 
I don't know, like enrich their products. Maybe that's not too bad of an issue. I don't know. Yeah. If it's for its own analytical purpose, it makes sense. Like like the yeah. fitness app or whatever, or or anything that collects data on you for you makes sense. And like, it shouldn't be taxed at that point. How data collection can help them better predict which types of people to give higher insurance premiums to. So in terms of like car insurance, like what if Tesla could collect the number of accidents based on model, age of their consumer, number of licenses on the car, blah, blah, blah share that information with Liberty Mutual and then they use that to better predict what type of premiums to give to different people. Or I think there's a different insurance agencies who have like devices that you can put in your car and they see how many red lights you stop at, do you follow the speed limit and based yeah. on that, give you insurance. That's insane. Mm -hmm. They do yeah. that. My mom's car used to have that. I think she got it taken out after she switched insurance or something. But like once she stopped, she braked really hard and the thing went beeping. I'm like, what is happening right now? Yeah, insurance companies have always, that's always been their business model though. Yeah. And I think you do need a, a razor here to separate between what yeah, yeah, yeah. always been, you know, the icky way it works and what is. Yeah, I mean, even like a hundred years back, they if they even sold like health insurance, they'd like even ask you for your height, weight. Like it started from there, but right now it's getting more, more, more like diversified. Like that now they also need this. Now they also need this. And now they're collecting this. They're like buying this. It's like, it's going like out of hand day by day. Yeah. I don't know what you guys think about this, but like, what if like more than a data tax, what if we like, what if the government or whoever, I don't know, like made it a law or whatever to like publicize, like who sells what data and who buys, like, I'm sure like some of this is already public, but like, like a good amount of it, or maybe even all of it. I don't, I don't really know, but like if it was publicized, you know, we would actually be like, able to see our data being sold or like know what it was being used for oh yeah yeah 100%. i i agree with that yeah if we just I had think apple does it right database. now on the app store it tells you what types of parameters each app is mm -hmm. collecting from you yeah there's some i'm sure you all know what gdpr is the european data thing where you can all companies in europe now have to show you what data they hold on you you can download it and delete it and that's a law that's looks like it'll be in the u.s in a year or so yeah, that's kind of part of what you want. But I feel like Europe is always ahead of us on these things. Like we're always late to the game. It's because Europe has like they have like actual like PhDs and like <laughs> like actual like scientists in their government and stuff. Like I, don't know. I would argue the opposite. I would say that Europe has less. Yeah, but like most of it is. Mm. Yeah. But so like remember, the thing is, the, the, the companies which are actually doing this. So. You know, they have a history of making some maybe questionable technical technical law decisions. They're yeah, and like all these companies are U.S. companies. They bring in jobs, they bring in money, they bring in GDP, they bring in taxes. And I don't think anyone's willing to like regulate them, especially tech. I don't think people saw us coming. Hey, Mantra, you were saying something. Yeah, I was saying the same thing. Like um, all of these companies are U.S. companies. So like, Definitely, they're not European companies, so definitely it's going to be first um, going to happen outside and then um, it's it's going to like happen where it actually affects the people who are doing it. Dirv, you're really quiet. Do you have anything to add? Um, I was just looking at the article that Govind um, linked on the chat. It's pretty insightful um, about using machine learning to gather data and like how privacy laws are um, like how privacy yeah. and all of these things and it's interesting because, like you mentioned like um, Europe has always been ahead of us in these regards um, and I think it's because like they have like a better grasp of like ethics because um, I took like a class like a year ago at UMass and like they really focus on those issues and that that basically lays on the foundation for a lot of these like either machine learning or like some other privacy laws um, yeah We should have invited like the legal club or something like do they have yeah. one of those at umass like that would have been a cool conversation to have them join in next time yeah i think they're uh, hopefully they're european <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think there's a good overlap between like laws and technology um and how 
and how laws might be shaped like like you were talking about um before right like how senators and the congress has little idea about technology so how it works in the us is that they partner with um companies so like if you have ibm if you have microsoft then there are like specific research researchers from those companies who like head different divisions for those laws and like how europe works totally different regarding that like they have like specific people who are phd's or someone else like within the government so it's interesting to see how like different countries work yeah so are you saying like the government just hires people at the companies they would make laws against to make laws against them yeah uh, at least in terms of like facial recognition how it works is that um like the um python like microsoft or ibm or like some other nvidia or like some other company so like their principal researchers the research wing um who primarily work on like heavy research on like these privacy laws but they're employed by the company but they're hired by government so like do and like dig into all of these facts but like in europe it's like the other way around okay so it's more like unbiased research basically yeah in a sense like you can say that like all of these researchers um are unbiased in a way but like since they work for these companies like are they really like i'm not sure mm, yeah i think i was reading some article about this too was it for 3 or 5 there was um yes <laughs> <laughs> there you go <laughs> i was doing like, research like later um on this topic as well like based off of it like yeah Oh, another thing we can talk about is like let's go a step beyond regulating tech companies. What about regulating people who use our technology? Like for example, I think it was the LAPD or some other police department in our country who was using crime data to predict where crime was going to happen and try to police those areas more heavily and try to like do more predictive policing. And it ended up that most of the areas that their model was predicting was lower income areas. and so they saw a huge spike in the number of police presence in their communities so what do you guys think about that sort of stuff is the article from pro publica by any chance i think uh, there's like 100 articles on that no i i i feel like pro like if anyone ever gets the time to read the, like pro publica's articles on these they're like a pulitzer prize winning like for these are types of articles but i feel like at this point it's like it's not the police that hold responsible it's the companies that actually collect the data i think clearview along those lines like clearview has been collecting like lots and lots of facebook pictures google pictures you know just searching people up you know linking them up and clearview has got like an insanely big database like there've been some videos of some reporters going there clearview was able to find pictures of them that aren't currently available on the internet like they were available at some point but they currently aren't you know so even if at some point say you had a public picture online clearly probably has it and they're allowed to do this because what it's public data Wait, is this like a website like clearview.com no i think it's a company called clearview oh. <laughs> you have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to get access to their stuff. i was about to go it's probably billions dude yeah, yeah, if they're working with the government the Yeah, I think I read like a similar article about Clearview as well. Like they do all kinds of these like facial recognition. They're basically creating a Google of faces. Like even after um like if you don't have any social media accounts linked to you, but you're on other people's social media accounts, like your face will pop up with your name and like all of these different tags. Um so it's kind That's of That's insane. Yeah. Robin, how do you know about this? Who are you searching up? <laughs> No, uh, you're not allowed to use it. I mean, <laughs> you sound so disappointed. <laughs> If I can jo- join the Chicago PD, I will let you know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like such companies should definitely be illegal. Like massive data collection, and when you know they're trying to sell it off to someone, you know, like collecting yeah. something but making it a business is a separate thing. That's what, yeah. or even like a data tax at that point would make that company more like ethically better because like you know you're taxing them for their data so they're not going to collect bullshit like they're going to collect data that they can actually sell and like make money out of but if they're making money off it they're also going to be paying you paying the government or whoever back but they're still going to make so much money off of it dude like 
just imagine how much these police departments are paying for that yeah kind of but data. then like they're still they're still like not forced to like collect so much of data on you because like you're probably going to get taxed for every terabyte of data you collect on someone or so the more data they collect on you they're they're going to end up paying more which means they're going to they're going to collect lesser data on you and then okay i forgot what i was going to say now yeah, but... <laughs> they're going to collect lesser data my brain froze <laughs> Yeah, but, like, um, I know you guys have been talking about data taxes, but do you guys not think like those costs are just going to be borne off to the consumers? Like in terms of Facebook, yeah. look at a data tax. That just means way more apps than they currently have. You know, yeah. their view, they just charge the government more than they currently do. And that money comes from our taxes, you know? So it's a bigger portion of our taxes actually end up going towards. The whole system's corrupt. Yeah, like it's like once you start taxing a business, you're basically just taxing yourself if you use their products, you know? I'm just making Facebook convenient for myself than it already is at this point. Well, no, but that's true about putting it back on the Charging country. for pennies, right? Like they have a very large margin of, of cash. Wait, who? Facebook. Yeah. So if you, were, if you were to do a data tax, what would happen is that Facebook would fight it and fight it and fight it. But if, you know, if we just platonically imagine that the tax went into effect, they'd pay it. And I disagree though, because look at DoorDash, like over here, I live in San Ramon and the, our neighboring city, Dublin, put a tax on all, on DoorDash for ordering from like, try to save like small businesses and their own delivery people. And all DoorDash did now is that if you order from Dublin, now you get taxed or you have to pay $2 extra. It's like a Dublin What's fee. What's the key difference between DoorDash and in fact, the entire gig economy market and Facebook? One is profitable and one has been consistently not profitable. I don't think DoorDash has ever had a profitable quarter. So that's not but really a fair comparison. Facebook will do. Uh, Facebook I think the food ones are doing good, right? The, no. Those companies are really struggling. They, no, they don't have not. profits yet. What about Uber Eats? Wasn't that like profitable or something? You can, you can go up a level and look at Uber proper. They still don't make money. No, no one's. Yeah, I don't think anyone in the gig economy, like app side of, of, of like, they haven't, they haven't figured it out yet. That's why they. I don't think Lyft's ever episode. reported a profit, has it? No. Like in Not, no way. No. If Uber can, Uber there's no yet? way Lyft has. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, if Uber oh, no, hasn't yeah, done absolutely. it yet, there's no way Lyft hasn't done it. Also, it's a little bit like worse airlines. But I still think the example stands because. Tech companies will do anything to make the consumer pay well, for it. Companies and not that have... aren't profitable will do everything to stay alive. No, yes. like companies, companies that, that are profitable company. will want to continue there. And the way Facebook makes money is by having as many people use their product. There will never be a charge on Facebook. Hmm. I but think the there could is, be hidden charges. Like it's like hidden charges. Facebook still has to like report an earnings call. You know, that's Facebook's. Like at the end of the day, the main company, the main aim of the public company is to like provide value to its shareholders, you know, like basically a business out there and like lower profits just makes Facebook a less valuable like business to invest in, in general, you know, why would face, why, does, why would Facebook not like go down the other path and try to make up for the money it's losing from the data tax? What's to stop them? Like at the end of the day, it's the earnings per share that they're trying to maximize over here. I agree. There, but what happened though, is that because Facebook is not the only data collection internet company, that's probably every single internet company that exists, that it wouldn't be Facebook alone. It would be a tech crash, the whole industry, probably because the industry is so big, the whole market would crash a little bit. And then you wait five years and it picks back up and you're fine. <laughs> so Facebook's not alone. You have to zoom out and get context. Like this, if we could totally do the data tax tomorrow and life would work fine. There's a lot of money. But like, also, how is that data tax being used then? Where is it being put into? I mean, if you're yeah, just going to collect that tax, tax, it has to be like well it's defined. Like, if the money stuff from the data money. tax is being sent to Clearview, like I'm going to lose my shit. Like that's ridiculous. <laughs> we could, we could still, we could pay for all the Clearview we wanted and still have plenty of money left over. So <laughs> no, but like, if it all goes to the military or something like that, that's just oh, sad. Cool. Wow. Oh yeah. All of our money already goes to America, pay. though. We can't really do anything. <laughs> It's like, oh, now we'll have twice the size we already had. That was already twice the size yeah, of the next probably. biggest one. Yeah. I wish I wish they like well defined things like this, you know. Well, they do. It's just, you know, people love the military and the government. Do you guys think lawmakers understand tech? And they understand I don't tech? Oh no. They're like the, the average lawmaker is probably like 80 plus in DC. 
who uses his grandson to set a zoom up for him. So I eighty doubt plus. It. <laughs> but even okay, younger, that, that's an exaggeration. Too. But like even like sixty plus at that point struggled with zoom. If, if like, I'm do you wrong. think Masaf, AOC, Amy Klobuchar? Do you guys think those people understand tech enough? There's a big age gap yeah. between the last two. I mean, not not <laughs> similar. Like kind of, but also like. Like, the yeah. thing is with with people like <laughs> with people like like AOC and stuff are younger that they're willing to talk to other people to like gain knowledge about tech and realize mm. what the issue is. I don't I guess. know about that one. AOC, I mean, is able to articulate how machine learning models discriminated against people who weren't white. Yeah, I think that's I a think you're definitely thing. able to learn. Like, unlike she that's one, it. like she's definitely like yeah. I don't know if she like does her he sets right the bar now. high though let's talk about those and and, and this people. isn't now that we're just talking i don't like this isn't just for aoc if we had like a lot of more lawmakers at her age they'd be more willing to learn and understand what's going on but at, at these guys' age they're just giving up they're like i'm just here at dc till i die at this point so <laughs> well, I, I think, I think that's where the that, issue right? is it's not out of laziness they believe that i mean they've ingrained their way of how the world works and they're not willing to yeah. change yeah that, that that's a more about that's a more better way to put it. Yep. disbelief yeah i mean like the more older senators or like older people in congress like view tech as bad because they didn't like grow up with tech or like they didn't, they didn't they don't have like that good of a perspective so like people like aoc since they kind of grew up with it they can understand but like if you have an inherent bias towards tech like what are you gonna do yep so do you think like companies like google facebook microsoft amazon should spend time like they all come to our hackathons. They teach students about their available APIs and blah, 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 blah. What is Google? Do you think they should do the same for lawmakers or is that just non-monetized lobbying? That's what they we should, they, should, they should start lobbying <laughs> yeah, for like, like policy majors or something like that, dude. Like just push <laughs> them, fund them, <laughs> make them win. <laughs> have like a law-a-thon. <laughs> laws, why not just, teaching, just go straight for getting the good laws? And that's what they do. They try. Just push their yeah. candidates, the young ones, you know, on their YouTube ads, Facebook ads, everything. Like major league lawmaking now, MLL. Did you hear what happened with Twitch and Amazon's union ads? That was creepy. Yeah. Which ads? That was what weird. Happened? So Amazon, Amazon's having a big union problem. I don't know if you know. They have yeah. all their fulfillment right. So yeah. they had they had this anti-union movement and they paid for ads. Well, they, did, they got free ads on Twitch for the anti-union movement. And they targeted it towards Amazon employees on Twitch. Wow. I heard Twitch pulled those though, didn't they? Did. they? That's they how did, people right? found out about it. As soon as they found out about it, they pulled those ads. Mm-hmm. That's that was crazy. Some, I know we talked about acquisitions last time, but some acquisitions just make me so sad. Like Twitch and Amazon, Instagram, wait, I don't get Facebook. Oh. Uh, I, wait, I have a question. So you're telling me that Amazon put up anti-union ads on Twitch? Yeah. Yes. And then, but then, isn't aren't they owned by the same thing? Like, is it, doesn't Amazon own Twitch? Yes. Yeah, so they did it for free. There's no cost for them. And because and of that, stopping. And, Twitch, and then Twitch pulled it out. And then Twitch pulled it out. Okay, okay. I, I, yeah, because Twitch, Twitch get under shit for that, or did Amazon get under shit for that? Or, like, Amazon. technically, it's the same person. Like, it's the same person. It's not, you know, it was Amazon's not. doing because Twitch got rid of the ads. Okay. Like, but like my like, question is, why didn't Twitch think about this twice before pulling their ads down? Like, why did they blindly put an anti-union ad on their platform look, when they knew that they were going to have to pull their ads work, down? It's all automated. So Twitch, it's not like... Oh, uh, okay. Okay, okay. Like yeah, Jeff that makes Bezos sense. doesn't automated. have to call the Twitch CEO, right? And be like, yo, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> plug me. <laughs> like, he just does it. You go send a guy to paint up this billboard to anti-union. <laughs> interesting because it took like google like a long time to form a good union and now they finally have a union like amazon was approaching the same thing and then they were like no you can't do that well, they're yeah, starting up again right i heard amazon's I investors though are telling amazon to like sit down and let their workers unionize amazon I mean, has getting investors? to that point where <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> amazon has huge multi-billion dollar investors well like yeah, damn. <sighs> yeah, that Google or what is it, the Alphabet Workers Union? That's crazy that that actually happened. Yeah, it's not for like wages and stuff like that, right? It's for company decisions. Yeah, and I think it's for more diversity and you know, classic company screw ups. Isn't the Amazon unionizing for warehouse workers? Yeah, that's that's for wages and being able to have bathroom breaks. And that's a very different 
Yeah, I feel like those are harder to get or do, I feel. Especially with the size of it, it, which Amazon is now and like their cockiness. Yeah, I'm sure it's, it's like... Oh, it's like China in there. Like they really control what those people see. Yep, it's really definitely, cool. definitely. Like you can see some of those stories on like any platform. You go on Twitter, you go on TikTok, you go on Instagram. There's some Amazon employee out there who's had a shitty day. Don't they have like shockers or am I like, am I lying? Like, I feel like I read that somewhere or like some crazy stuff. I heard they have to like pee in water bottles. Yeah, I definitely heard that. Yeah. Like, I want to say, why are people going and working there? But they pay well somehow. No, and the thing is, even when people quit, you can instantly find another person who needs that job again. So, like, even if there's a high, like, quitting it or whatever, you get a person back quick. That's why they're incentivized to breakout unions too right because they can just quickly replenish all the workers mm-hmm. yep yeah dude that's just too much power all right we have a few minutes left do you want to talk about the meetings that we wanted to talk about yeah sure um so next week uh we'll be having adam benby um who's a senior pm at ibm and he's a umass alumni i think he graduated in 2005 or 2006 um, and he's been at IBM for almost like 15, 16 years. So he'll be talking about his experience at UMass. Um, and like, we're excited to have him because he's our first speaker of the year, uh, first speaker for this semester. And we're like, I'm especially excited because like, I want to see what, uh, what, an, what like a UMass ex- uh, alumni looks like and like whether like there was a, a club or like something that helped him go into product or something. Like that. Um, but yeah, um, he'll be joining us next week, same time. And we'll just be having like a general um, presentation from him. And then we'll be diving into Q&A about what his experience at UMass was like. And then what was the week after the one we want to talk about? The Let's Design one? Oh, um, I think that's on the 24th. Yeah. Um, I remember. Oh, no, no. Rocket Blocks. Yes. Yeah, so um, the week after <laughs> that is Rocket Blocks, March 17th. And they'll be, we'll be doing like a technical fluency um, workshop with them. And their founder, um, I think he worked, like, worked at a few different companies and he founded Rocketblock. So he'll be giving us a deep dive on how PMs work in technology. So like, we're, we'll be um, like over like all of these discussions, uh, we wanna like actually have something tangible across that. So that's the reason for all of these workshops and all these speaker series so that people can take something out of that. Yeah, so in that workshop, he'll kind of be talking about like what type of technical fluency you need to actually be a PM. Um, so maybe you need SQL, maybe you need basic Python programming. I don't think you do, but whatever he says, um, I think he was a PM at Google and then Zynga, if you've heard of it. So that will be cool. And then the week after that, we're hoping to do like a design wireframing workshop. So PMs at the beginning of any product planning sprint are in charge of working with designers to kind of understand what a feature should look like, what the kind of just like user experience should be like when you click a button what should the response be and what should this be and what should that be so if you can download figma before the next whatever it is two or three weeks um, we actually get the premium subscription for free as umass students so sign up for that and hopefully we'll have some fun in our meeting like doing some wireframing for common apps we use like twitter and doordash and that'll be fun yeah, yeah. If you guys take CS325, you learn about Figma too. I just want to throw that out there. If you guys take CS325. Oh, nice. Yeah. Cool, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Cool. Bye. Thanks Good for having you guys. Bye. See you guys next Bye. week. Bye. 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 Bye.